be seated. Now, I don't remember if it was a radio ad or I don't know if it was an NPR thing, but it was like a, it was, you, you make history every day. And it's this idea, I like it, it's a little brain worm type thing that you know, every day you do something, you've made history. And it always caught me as both a clever phrase of this idea that what you do matters every day, but also that history is just a matter of time. And so what I do today, tomorrow will be history. And it always have, it's always stuck with me with this idea that history is important. There were people living at that time when it wasn't a history book but it was just what they did in that day. And I've been thinking of it this week because this week was Yom HaShoah, and as time has been going on, it has been seeping into history. And, but for some, like having the honor of having a survivor come and speak to our religious school kids this week, it was not history, it was his life experience. But we are at this in-between moment where fewer and fewer people have lived this experience, and so it means that those days are slipping into history, and we have to make sure that it does not fall away. That as Jews and as Jewish communities, Yom HaShoah is more than just a day, it is an identity, it is part of our history, and I fear that Yom HaShoah will just sort of be like Tisha B'Av, a historic event, but it is so distant from us that Tisha B'Av, we joke that if it wasn't for Camp Ramah in the summer, no one would notice that Tisha B'Av happened in the middle of the summer. Yom HaShoah can't slip away. It is up to us to make sure that we preserve and learn from these experiences. The experiences, of course, that I'm talking about, the Yom HaShoah is the day of Holocaust Memorial, that it is a day that has different titles for some. It is a day of martyrs and heroes, is how it is described in Israel, because both all of these things were the experiences of these years where the intentional, purposeful, calculated murder of six million Jews took place and millions more of gypsies and homosexuals and others as well, as well as within the greater context of World War II where 20 million Russians died, right? But somehow it is different because this was designed and part of the war plan was to wipe out our people. It's interesting, the Parsha this week is Achremot, which means after the death, and the Torah is talking about the death of Aaron's sons, but it feels like we are at this moment as well, Achremot, what do we do after the deaths of six million? When I was a kid, I had the opportunity to go on March of the Living. March of the Living is a program that brings teenagers from around the world to the European death camps. And I remember sitting or standing at a large mass grave of ashes, thinking to myself, what is the difference between them and me? I happen to be born in a different decade on a different continent, but that was just luck. That was just fortune, that was happenstance. Because if I had happened to have been born in those years on that continent, I would be in that ash pile. And that of all the differences and all of the mind tricks we play on ourselves to say that that is distant, that is somewhere else, that is them, and therefore I am protected, is actually just fallacy. And sometimes it just comes down to luck of the decade and the continent. And of course, in that ash pile, there was no differences between 
what we would call today Orthodox Jews and Reformed Jews and Conservative Jews, right? Those movements didn't really exist in the same way in the 30s and 40s, right? But if you were secular in Vienna or living in the ghetto in Poland, there was no difference for the Nazis. You ended up in the same place. 1949 was the first Yom HaShoah uh, in Israel. Of course, that was right after Israel was founded in 48. And 49 was the first commemoration. And what they did was they took what must have been the equivalent of thousands of people. They took the ashes and they moved them from Europe and reburied them in Israel. Impossible to know how many were in, how many humans, how many Jews that accounted for. In 1950, the second commemoration, they took piles and piles and reams and reams of Torah scrolls that had been desecrated and they reburied them in Israel. And then in 1951, it became an official national holiday, a moment of the sirens, and the, it has been tweaked a little bit over the, over the years, but it is a moment of national, and I say peoplehood recognition, not just within the state of Israel, but within the Jewish people. This week I had the opportunity to be at the JDS community, Sarah Rourke, uh, one, we have both librarians here, um, Sarah Frackett and Sarah Rourke, but Sarah Rourke has been putting together a, a, a Yom HaShoah program for the, some of the students for many, many, many years. Um, and it is amazing, but this is the first time I had the opportunity to, to actually be there. Jennifer Weitzner, and Howard is here as well, as well Bethel members, and uh, Jack and Max has recognized them as well. But uh, Jennifer's family has an amazing collection of Holocaust material. I don't even want to call, I'm not even sure if, if we use terms that are more of like a museum, it puts it into that historic far away category. I like to think of it as material witnesses. These are, this is material that has lived through the experiences of the Holocaust. And Sarah and Jennifer have a dialogue that they, they do. They did it in the Beit Midrash. And I hesitantly asked Jennifer if she would join me today um, to talk about this collection, which is so powerful and is so important to keep this experience and this material alive because those that actually wore it perished. Those that actually encountered these objects are not here to talk about it. And she said on one condition that she could continue the dialogue with Sarah. So I want to invite Sarah and Jennifer to, to come here and to have a dialogue about this collection, how it came into the family, how it, and what it means to be the caretaker of, of this material. So, uh, Sarah. Okay, I, I may remember some of the details incorrectly, but my recollection is that um, when my own son, who's an adult, was a small child at JDS, he came home after Yom HaShoah and he told me a very horrifying fact of numbers of deaths. And I said, oh, uh-huh, that's interesting and that must have been really upsetting to hear. And then the next day, I went to the um, director of Judaics at uh, the lower school at JDS, and I said, I wonder if maybe there was a more age-appropriate way to commemorate Yom HaShoah. Um, so he said, OK, now you're in charge of Yom HaShoah. So <laughs> since then, I've been in charge of Yom HaShoah. And then many years ago, uh, Jennifer came and told me about this amazing collection that her father had um, put together. And um, I got to come and visit your home and see 
many of the items that are in this collection, and then we chose together some of the things that seemed like they would be um, not too scary for kids to see, but evocative and meaningful for kids to see. So, um, so let's just start off with talking about how did your father come to collect all of these different things? Um, I just want to quickly thank you, Rabbi Harris, and thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Bethel, for having me and for everybody for listening. Um, so how did, I, how did uh, my father collect these items? My father was a stamp collector, and in those days there were the catalogs that would arrive pre-internet, and they would have pictures of the stamps and prices and explanations. And he got, he got these catalogs in the mail and he would pick out the stamps he liked, but he started to see Holocaust items for sale in the stamp catalog. So some of them were um, Nazi stamps and then there were some other items like money from the concentration camps or money from the ghettos. And so he just started thinking, who, who is gonna buy this stuff? But he wasn't buying this stuff because he was a stamp collector. So a few more catalogs came. You know, it's like things wear you down. And he just kept thinking about it. And he said, I'm going to buy it. I'm going to buy it because if I buy it, I know that I will keep it safe. Um, there are Holocaust deniers out there. And he didn't know if people would buy it and shred it or, you know, he, he just didn't know. So he felt better if he owned it. So when he saw items coming up for sale, he just started buying them. And so we've been talking about items, but, but we should talk about what are some of the particular things that are in the collection that are most powerful. Right. Okay. So I was trying to think of how many items there are. I think there are about 400. And kind of like what is in the encyclopedia like I don't know how to answer that so I, I brought some notes but basically I think of the items as two different piles one are the paper items that fit nicely in the binder and one are the other items that are more tangible that are in boxes um, so the the paper items are money from the ghettos from um, the concentration camps passports that are marked with the J for Jew, um, a lot of letters requesting from the government to get out. Um, it'll, be, it'll be the letters that returned back to the families that I have. Um, the quota for polls is full, try again in a year. Um, I have letters like that. I have letters, people requesting to the Red Cross, where is my brother, mother, sister, child, um, all different paper items like that. Um, I also have the tangible items. Those can be everyday items. When people went to, when people were deported, they were told to bring things of their everyday life to recreate life, supposedly, when they get somewhere. So I have everyday things such as glasses, coats, a doll's outfit, um, I have a meat grinder. Um, I have ice skates, all from, you know, collected at Auschwitz. So um, I have the stars that the Jews had to wear, uniforms, the blankets that people had to keep warm as their only thing. Uh, no mattresses in the concentration camps, just a blanket. So I have that. I have items made out of. Torah scrolls, desecrated items, um, so all different things. So I'm just going to mention a few of the things that make the biggest impact on the kids when they see them. The desecrated Torah scrolls that, that you mentioned, the Torah scrolls were cut up and turned into different things. Oh, you brought them with you. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. So. Um, so this was a, a shoe insole insert that the Nazis cut up and then, you know, stuck in their shoes and then walked on the Torahs. So to see, I've seen this so many times and it still gives me chills to see that. Um, and uh, when, when we do this program at JDS, one of the kids uh, chants the portion that's on this particular scroll. 
Were you going to mention that? Oh, that um, it's actually the part of the Torah where Jacob is leaving for Padan Aram, and God says to him, um, I, I will be with you wherever you go, and I will stay with you when you return to this land. And, and you can imagine um, <laughs> that's a very significant thing to be saying in connection to the Holocaust, that, that God will always be with you wherever you are, that God was in this place and I did not know this, that, that this is the gateway to heaven. Um, so those words are, are here. Of course, the Nazis didn't know when they cut it up that, that it was going to be a significant piece, but you know, as you take it with commentary with the kids, it's, it's very powerful. Um, and also, there's just a power of objects, simple objects that were there in that place. So we have a cup that was picked up in Auschwitz. And just the fact that, you know, it's just a tin cup, but it was actually there as sort of witness to that, that time and place, and it's very powerful uh, to see. So, um, so what did your father do when he collected all of these items? What was his uh, goal to do with them? Yeah, so once he had amassed all these items, he had to figure out what to do, and he started lecturing. He would go to schools and synagogues, JCCs, anywhere who would accept him, and he would um, put out the items and speak about them. And he educated a lot of people informally. Um, there's something about being up close with the items rather than you know, a glass, you know, and the items are behind the glass and you have to make the trip to the museum. He was in people's synagogues right there, so. And so that relates directly to the next question, which yeah. is why didn't he donate them to a museum? Right. Um, perhaps, perhaps if a museum was starting up in New Jersey, which is where we're from at that time, and had requested the items, perhaps he would have given them. But we seem to find out about the Holocaust uh, museums after they're up and already have many of the items. So the museums have most of these items that are in the collection, and I have talked to the U.S. Holocaust Museum, whereas every museum would love to have these items. I was told that Honestly, they would not be on display because other items are already on display, but they would love to have them and they would be in their archives, which would be uh, called upon and studied by graduate students and other scholars. Uh, to me, I felt that the collection is most worthwhile when it's not in an archive studied by scholars, but when it is at JDS or other places um, being shown directly to large groups of people. And was there any particular thing that you know that like really spoke to your father that had special significance for him? Um, I, I wish I asked him that. He's passed away, so I don't know, but um, I was trying to think if there's an item that speaks to me. And quite honestly, there's so many items, and every item that I look at, I still think about. I've had the collection for 25 years, and I still look at it and ponder on it, and it, it brings up all these questions and all these emotions. So um, instead, of, instead of talking about the same item, which um, brings up emotions, I guess whenever I speak, I try to highlight a different item, and I did bring one item today. So hopefully you can see it, but I think it's a, a winter coat. It's a small black velvet coat, probably for a three-year-old, and it was found at Auschwitz. I have um, authentication papers for every item in the collection, and um, I, I don't know. There's not too much to say. I mean, the item's here, and the person is not. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know. It feels a little eerie that the person's gone and, and their coat is here. It, it, it feels like, 
I, I don't know. It just it, it raises so many questions in me, and it, I think it's so unsettling. So, I don't know. Um, so he did, he did have a lot of Holocaust money and stamps and papers. He was really a scholar. Uh, I think, you know, I was a kid, but I think he just knew a lot. Um, some people are just almost like encyclopedias and he seemed to be that way. Um, I know he had books for the money and the stamps and coins. So he gave me some of those. But other than that, I, I don't know how he, how he knew about everything, but I guess he, he was an avid reader. Yeah. Thank you. So as the um, children are wa walking through the exhibit, we ask them to um, write about the different things that they see and what questions arise for them, what emotions arise for them, what stories, why they think this particular thing was kept. Uh, we don't show the coat. <laughs> That's not one of the things that we show because it's so, so really painful to see. Um, but when I was talking to my sister yesterday about that we were gonna talk about this this morning, that was what I um, said to her because it's so impactful to see that um, people dressed their children in their best clothing to go to die. And they didn't know where they were going, but they dressed up in their best clothes, and that's really um, hard to, to fathom. Um, so thank you so much for bringing that. Um, and since we started this many years ago, you have done all kinds of new things with the collection. So tell us about the latest developments. I have, thank you. Um, when I... I always, I always try to contact places and see, you know, would you like a showing? Would you like a showing? And I guess for the past 10 years, I've been hearing, well, send me an email with a link to your website, and then I'll be happy to look it over. But I'm actually an architect, and I have a family, and I don't know how to make a website. So that question, while I understood it, it always kind of set me back to the starting block. So I've had in my mind that I wanted to make a website for a long time. And somehow when COVID started, I thought now I'm gonna do it. And um, I, hired, I hired a web designer, uh, a student, so it didn't cost me that much money, which is great. Um, she's been fabulous. And I also um, found an intern through the University of Maryland and she got college credit to assist me. And um, the main things, I mean, I'm trying to do educational outreach, but I also want to preserve the collection. So um, I ordered all um, acid-free paper and all the archival materials and everything got changed over to, I, I think that the previous stuff that it was kept in was also archival and acid free, but I have no one to ask. So I decided that I just wanted to be 100% sure and start over and repackage everything. So I did that. I had the intern make a list of every single item, write down what it was, flag anything that still needs to be translated. We've done um, probably another 100 translations in the past two years. Uh, part of my problem, a lot of it is um, paper, and it says very powerful things. If you speak German or Polish or Russian, um, but I don't speak any of those, so I've had to get every item translated. So I've gotten many more items translated. I've gotten a better list, and I've started this website, and... Um, you know, I invite you all, if you remember this, it's uh, www.v for virtual holocaust museum.com. So I had the idea to set up the website as a virtual museum, and I have tours on there that highlight the artifacts in the collection, as well as um, 
a quiz to make it interactive and fun, and some learn on your own documents that I don't really say much about. I just put them up there and I have like one paragraph and people can really analyze it themselves and think about what it means. So um, that's, that's what I've been doing. That's amazing. Well, thank you for being the guardian of this collection and thank you for sharing it with all of us today and at JDS every year. It's thank really you. amazing. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Jennifer Weitzner and Sarah Rourke. Thank you for sharing that today. That the answer to this is Ahremot is this week and next week's Parsha is Kedoshim. After the death is holiness. And the care that is put into this collection is an act, is a sacred act, is an act of holiness. Our acts of how we decide every day to make sure that this historic event does not slip into history is Kedoshin, is also an act of holiness and it is an act of responsibility. So Jennifer and to Howard and to your family and to your dad, um, thank you for this act of making sure that the Holocaust does not slip into history, um, but it is present in our awareness. So again, vholocaustmuseum.com to learn more about com. Um, vholocaustmuseum.com um, to, to learn more about this collection um, and that may we be worthy of being the caretakers but also the receivers of our rich tradition. Shabbat Shalom.